Welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mariash. Thanks for spending some time with us today. One brief reminder, check out our video interview series, Conversations with B'nai B'rith, on Facebook and YouTube. You'll find discussions with historians, journalists, Middle East experts, even an astronaut and an NFL player. And watch our latest content by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook, at B'nai B'rith International. Well, in normal times, sports serve as a global unifier cutting across race, religion, gender, politics, and socioeconomic status. But during the coronavirus pandemic, sports have served and continue to serve an even greater purpose to whisk us away from the pain and suffering all around and give us all from New York to Netanya to New Delhi something to savor and thoroughly appreciate. Well, joining me to give his take on the state of sports at this transitional moment, particularly in Israel, is Josh Halleckman, better known as the Sports Rabbi. Halleckman has attended more than 4,000 sporting events in 25 plus countries, searching for intriguing and enlightening stories, and has lectured to thousands about the intersection of Zionism and Israeli sports. Josh, thanks for being here. We're pleased to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, let's talk about you uh, for a moment. Uh, how did you come up with the idea for Sports Rabbi, and how do you approach storytelling? And, and particularly, tell us about the intersection of your desire to share sports so stories as well as Zionism. In other words, how do you incorporate Zionism into your sports writing? Yeah, so it's, a, it's an interesting question. The, the name Sports Rabbi, the moniker, uh, came from Rabbi Avi Weiss from the uh, Hebrew Institute of Riverdale back around 20 plus years ago. Uh, and it was really the impetus of Malcolm Glazer, the uh, obviously former owner of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Manchester United, and so forth. And kind of the name came from a meeting that the two of them had way back when. And uh, I actually couldn't understand how did I become the sports rabbi? Rabbi Weiss had needed some information about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He was visiting Malcolm Glazer on one of his trips to Florida. I was able to give it to him the next week at uh, synagogue from the pulpit. Rabbi Weiss says, I needed information about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Who can I call? None other than the sports rabbi, Josh Halleckman. And everybody looked and said, what is a sports rabbi? And I couldn't figure out what the sports job I was until I got to Israel in 2004. It took me a while uh, as a huge sports fan growing up in Montreal and somebody that's a, an ardent Zionist uh, who has a love for Israel. Those are my passions, Israel, sports, family, uh, my immediate family, obviously, my wife and my, my three boys uh, made Aliyah back in 2004. And I tried to figure out how can I put those things that I love so much together. The sports, Israel, family, what, how does that all work? Where does it come together? And very quickly after I had arrived in Israel, I found a huge world of Israeli sports that I had never known about. I had made countless trips to Israel. I'm sure you have too, Dan. And most of the time, we, I had never even thought about going to a Maccabi Tel Aviv basketball game or to a Hapoel Tel Aviv soccer game or traveling the country to all the great neighborhoods and communities and cities that exist here. It wasn't even a thought. I hadn't even occurred to me that, wow, there is something to do. Now, the year before we made Aliyah, I started really following Maccabi Tel Aviv on a regular basis because I knew, well, I'm going to have to try to find a successful team to watch after living in New York for so many years and following the New York Yankees and being able to go to so many Great World Series and playoff games between 96 and or 95 and 2003, of course. And it was quite amazing. When I got here, I saw that there was just so much sports. Now, people think Israel sports, what do they have to do with each other? Uh, you know, Olympics, you think Olympic sports. Unfortunately, you think back to the tragedy in Munich. You don't see the life and the beauty of what's going on if it's on the soccer field or on the judo mat. Uh, and that was something that attracted me right away. And I'll tell you, that was my best dual pun. Sure, I came with a background in Hebrew coming from, uh, you know, my background in Montreal and, and going to Jewish day school. 
but it was not the Israeli Hebrew. And the first thing I did when I moved here, I took, took a subscription out to Yediot Achronot, which is one of the leading newspapers. I still have that subscription today. I had a little electronic dictionary. Of course, those this is way before the Google Translate days. And I would sit with the sports section every morning, typing in words that I just didn't know. And I started listening to the sports radio shows here in Israel. And I started watching the sports in Hebrew. I started going to the games. And little by little, I opened up this huge, huge community that I didn't even know existed. And that was really the, the start of what the sports rabbi is. And then I started writing for the Jerusalem Post a little bit uh, since 2005, 2006. I still write for them today. And around 2010, I decided to uh, start a, a website called sportsrabbi.com. And we actually just did a total revamp uh, back in December of 2020. We took some of the COVID time to try to see what our audience wanted. And they wanted more Hebrew, actually. So we started a Hebrew side of the website. The English side has been going on since 2010, really. And uh, off we went, very active on social media. And I think that the, the great part about Israeli sports is, is telling those stories that come out of Israel. The love of blue and white sports. If it's an Olympic athlete that is trying to reach the top of their game, if it is that retired, uh, retired athlete that is just taking their time now, the Kashakar pair, who is at the top of the women's tennis world, making it you know to very deep into the Australian Open once upon a time, who's now a mother, or if it's just looking at the other sports, jujitsu and the soccer field and everything else, if it's handball. And uh, you know, I always tell people when you come to Israel, you've got to go to an Israeli sporting event because it's the most Zionist feeling you'll ever have. And that, for me, was when I attended my first Maccabi Tel Aviv EuroLeague basketball game. You're in an arena packed with 11,000 people. Before the game starts, the fans sing Atikva. They sing the national anthem. It's not, it's the national anthems aren't sanctioned by the EuroLeague itself. So the fans have to literally, two and a half minutes before tip-off, everybody stands up. And everybody, powerfully, I'm getting goosebumps as we speak, literally right now. Everybody gets up from their seats and sings a tikva. It is the one of the most amazing moments that anyone can experience. And I want everybody around the world to be able to experience that as well. You know, um, I think people don't realize, if you look back at some of the uh, film clips, and there is a documentary on it, uh, of course, about Israel's winning the uh, European League uh, Basketball Championship in, in 1977 against uh, Varese of Italy. But uh, people don't realize that uh, Israeli fans are, are really robust and, um, and follow their teams really literally to the, to the ends of the earth. Um, you talk about the Hebrew and the English. Um, have you, how have you cultivated the following in Israel? I'm sure you, in the States and other places you, you have a, a big following. But in, in Israel itself, where sports is covered, uh, there, are, there are sports pages in, in the newspapers, and, and TV does cover it. How have you um, succeeded uh, in Israel itself amongst the fans? You know, it, it's kind of interesting you ask that question. Um, I remember going to one of my first press conferences, and I'm sitting in a room all the way in the back, and people look at me like I'm a specimen, especially in soccer. They see, who is the six foot two? Ashkenazic guy. Like, what is he doing here? Soccer in Israel is a Sephardic sport. It's a Mizrahi sport. And we're all five foot five. Who is this American dude sitting there? And I remember putting up my hand and saying, uh, I have a question, sports rabbi, Josh Halleckman. And they all looked at me like, who is this? Uh, and I was able to ask the question in English because it was an English speaker that uh, was answering it. Uh, but then little by little, you know, the media people start looking at me and they're like, who is this guy? And he's going to all the basketball games and he's making connections with all the basketball players because I am a, an Anglophone, even though I speak fluent Hebrew now. All the American basketball players that are playing here, both ones that have made all the other Jewish and others that are playing here uh, over the time being, uh, if it's an Anthony Parker, for example, that ended up having a great career in the NBA, uh, you can develop those relationships. So all of a sudden, you are embedded in this Israeli culture. Um, you know, we had we actually put out a breaking news piece yesterday 
uh, we just decided to put it out in Hebrew because we felt it spoke to the Hebrew speaking audience. And, you know, little by little, it just spread across the Israeli internet scene. And, you know, last night when I was at a basketball game and I have some of the other reporters coming up to me and say, that was a good scoop you got today. Like, we checked it out afterwards. And, you know, that's what it's been for the last 15 years. On one hand, people are still like, who is this guy? You know, this Anglophone, English speaking, North American. And, but yet I am, you know, making waves in uh, the Hebrew speaking Israeli society, uh, which is something else. It's two different, it's kind of two different animals because the English side is much more of this Zionistic love for Israel and telling you what's going on in the Israeli sports scene that, that reaches out to Israel lovers, Jews around the world, and to potential athletes that want to come play here. The Hebrew side is like any other Israeli Hebrew sports website, trying to bring breaking news, the latest stories, analysis, and also uh, getting phone calls from various press officers uh, with comments and uh, critiques as well all the time. So it's kind of fun. It's, 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 a great, it's a great mode to be able to really delve into Israeli society. What's the uh, biggest surprise you've encountered uh, since you launched the Sports Rabbi? I mean, it could be a challenge or a favorite interview, memorable moment. Uh, what what was what was that that favorite experience that you've had so far? Well, I had this comes right off the top of my head. Back in 2013 or 14, um, the Miami Heat were playing the uh, Boston Celtics. It was the Eastern Conference uh, Finals. And I have uh, I have a regular NBA uh, pass because I am an Israeli outlet, and because of that, I'm you know right now we're covering Danny Avdi. I'm sure we'll get to that a little bit in, uh, for the Washington Wizards. But I've had NBA credentials for the last ten years or so, and I had one of my representatives at the press conference, and uh, he raises up his hand. This is so and so from Sports Rabbi to LeBron James, and LeBron and everybody turned their head, swivel their head in this room of three hundred people. And they were like, what? Sports rabbi? And all of a sudden, this like blew up on Twitter. This is back when Twitter was not even that big. And they're like, sports rabbi? At the sports rabbi? Who is the sports rabbi? And uh, that, got a lot of, that got a lot of fun, you know. And, and somebody like uh, LeBron James is like, looking at you, sports rabbi, like, what's going on? Uh, you know, you can't get any better PR than that, right? <laughs> Do you think non-Israeli... Um sports uh, fans are surprised at, at how much Israelis embrace sports of all kinds. I mean, a lot of people think, think of Israel and, and, and should as, as being in a very difficult uh, security situation, having to worry always uh, about its neighbors and the situation in the region. But with your, with your Anglo and, and Canadian uh, background, uh, you have another perspective. How do you think people in, uh, interpret others' perception of sports in Israel? I, I, they don't have a clue. <laughs> it's kind of funny to say it, but people outside of Israel don't really have a clue until they're here. Because, when, listen, Dan, when somebody comes to Israel, sports is not on the list of the required sites. Masada, the Western Wall, the Dead Sea, uh, maybe Teilat, maybe a trip to Haifa, uh, going to the Galil, uh, going to, down to the desert, right? Those are things that are going to be on the typical trip. And one of the things that I've wanted to change, and I've been doing this over the last uh, five, six, seven years, was I put together a program that's perfect for teenagers, students that are coming to visit here in Israel, that really intersect the modern day state of Israel with Israeli sports to understand this Zionist understanding that there are sports here in Israel. It's not just that one medal we won back in X year or the two medals we won in 2016 in Rio or the one gold medal we won uh, back in 2004 in Athens by Gal Friedman, uh, it is a lot bigger. And what I've been able to do is I put together a presentation, a poly multimedia presentation that I've given to thousands literally around the world in many different countries uh, about the, the life of this country from the late 1890s, before even Israel was uh, the state of Israel, uh, until today, and how that the world of sports in Israel tells the story of this country. And that has been taken by so many different people and it's blown away people. And, you know, again, trying to push the, the younger groups, the birthright groups, uh, you know, come and spend an hour with me, an hour and a half with me. That is the greatest age group because who doesn't like sports today? What youth 
what young adult, what adult really, doesn't love sports? And during that course of an hour, hour and a half, 45 minutes, whatever it is allocated, I can really go deep down from the times of Theodore Herzl and Basil to present day Israeli history through the history of Israeli sports. And I think it gives people a a very big perspective. If it's uh, talking about the kibbutz movement, the socialists, the capitalists, the differences between Maccabi and Apoel, which exist even today, that tells the story of the building of the state of Israel back in the the teens and the 1920s. And I think the more people that can be exposed to that, the more they'll understand that, yeah, sure, Israel is in the Middle East, there's conflict around us, but there's a big world out there that can be taught in so much more of a positive way through the realm of sports itself, Dan. How has uh, the COVID-19 pandemic changed the way you uh, consume and analyze uh, sports? You've attended uh, many sporting events uh, around the world. Uh, you must be itching to get back to the sold out crowds and immersing yourself in the full game experience. Look, we, you know, we watch baseball here um, in the States and um, I'm, a, I'm a big baseball fan. Uh, love to be at the ballpark. But even when you're watching on TV during normal times, you have the crowd noise and, and the real crowd noise, not the one that's coming from <laughs> uh, from a, a you know. A, tape recorder somewhere. Um, so how has it changed for you? So uh, I, thankfully for me, I've been able to go to plenty of sports here in Israel because of uh, my press credentials. Uh, we're allowed into sporting events. Um, you know, we have to be masked. We have to be socially distanced from our colleagues. They've really only allowed a select few people that come in to all the sporting events, I'm one of those people because uh, the coverage that uh, I provide to the various different sports leagues. So I've been very fortunate to be able to go to so many different sporting events that the normal person hasn't been. I've probably actually been to more sporting events since COVID started in the past year, just because working from home kind of also gives me a little bit more leeway. <clears throat> if I want to drive to Haifa a little bit earlier, if I want to drive down south to uh, Beersheba, uh, even tomorrow night, I'm going to be doing a double header. Uh, there's a game at 7 and a game at 9.15, both in Tel Aviv. And I know I won't have a problem parking at the second game so because there's no fans. Uh, so that, you know, literally I can get from one place to the next. Uh, that's obviously being selfish, and we, we miss the fans. Uh, the players, I think the players really, really miss the fans. Um, I don't think they, you know, they always say beforehand, eh, the fans, they don't play an effect on anything in the game. That was their always their their word before the pandemic. Believe me. The, the, the players miss it, both the opposing team and the home team. Uh, the media misses it, other than the parking situation, which is always very good now. Uh, but we miss it. You know, we miss, you know, being able to hang out with our colleagues and to be able to go out to get a bite to eat before a game or get a bite to eat after the game or to be able to just, you know, talk in close groups or be able to go into the locker rooms after the games. We, you know, we don't have that access anymore. The, uh, the press conferences are kind of limited. The, the teams do the best that they can. And we have live press conferences actually in the arena, uh, but you're still scattered around. You're, you, know, you have to do what you can do in those matters. I am itching to go on a, a field trip out of the country very, very much, actually. Uh, the last trip I made was literally two weeks before the pandemic hit. Uh, my wife and I were on our 25th wedding anniversary. And we went to Athens, and of course, um, you know, a, a no sports trip ended up becoming a lot of sports trip. I uh, got to go to a bunch of games, did some interviews. Uh, my wife was totally understanding of that, thankfully. Uh, and we had a great time. Uh, it was a great time. And coming back on the airplane, there were some people wearing masks already, and some people weren't. Uh, but, you know, coverage wise, to some, I've actually had an advantage because with the Washington Wizards right now, for example, I can get on their Zoom press conferences with Denny Avdia. I would never have that opportunity if there wasn't this pandemic. And I'm able to get uh, quotes and I can ask questions that I wouldn't have that opportunity, even though I do have a representative and a correspondent in D.C. that that is going to the games. It gives me the chance to have that one-on-one through Zoom that I wouldn't have had. So on one hand, there are things we miss. On the other hand, we're taking advantage of what we can. And you know, I've met so many people on Zoom in the past year that I would have never met in a million years. Even the fact that we're having this podcast right now, Dan, 
I don't know if we would have done no, that. I think you're I think you're right. I think that's true. Uh, when when the the story of Zoom and COVID comes out, there'll be some some real interesting chapters for sure. You know what you say about the fans, I, I agree. You know, we talk about here home field advantage, home court advantage, and um and so much of that advantage is is having the fans in the stands. So we hope we'll be able to return to that situation soon. But let's talk about basketball. We mentioned earlier um that Israeli basketball really came to the world's attention uh, when Maccabi Tel Aviv won that Euro championship uh, back in 1977. But give us your analysis uh, of, of Denny Abdia, uh, who became the highest uh, drafted player from Israel in NBA history uh, by going number nine overall to the Washington Wizards in November's uh, NBA draft. How have you approached talking about Abdia's uh, early career uh, and what do you see as uh, the upside that he brings to the Wizards and to the NBA and to and to basketball? You know, I've been very fortunate uh, to be able to get to know Denny from a 15-year-old. So that gave me an advantage right off the bat, going to youth games, seeing him in youth tournaments as, as a kid. I mean, not as the six-foot-nine-and-a-half, six-foot-ten, big, strapping 20-year-old right now. Uh, but I got to see him as a, you know, scrawny kid growing up playing pretty good basketball. I was at his professional debut. I schlepped all the way down with my photographer's son. And that's that's how I got my family involved in sports, Rabbi, is that all my my boys are involved in various different ways with the website. And one of them is a photographer. He was an army photographer for the IDF as well. Um, and we went down to his uh, his debut. And ever since then, we've taken trips. I've been to Belgrade with him. I've been to uh, Athens. I've been to so many different countries where I've been able to watch him play. I've seen him over a hundred plus times. He has a very bright future ahead of him. And not only is he talented, but he's a mensch. And that I think is the most important thing about Danny Avdia is that he's a good kid who is always looking to learn, always looking to get better. He was raised extremely well by his wonderful parents uh, he is just a pure mensch of a gentleman uh, to speak to. We have a lot of fun together. Even on these Zoom calls, we still have a lot of fun. He has, we have a little shtick going. He makes me, uh, before I present the question to him, he makes me announce his name the way that the PA announcer in, uh, in Yad Eliyahu in the Maccabi Tel Aviv home arena does. And we've been doing that now for a couple of years. It's a little shticky thing that goes, but uh, he loves it. Um, He's just a good kid. And because of that, he has the right attitude. He's a leader. He has all the intangibles. And of course, basketball skills, everybody was critical of his shooting. And boy, oh boy, his three-point shooting has been pretty good since he's come over to the NBA. Uh, nobody can complain. You know, People say it's a little bit wonky, his shooting style. But this is not the shooter that we had expected uh, looking at statistics. And they say, you know, statistics don't tell the whole story. And I think that a lot of draft experts and teams as well look very heavily at his statistics and judged him by his statistics. I spent probably close to two years speaking to various different media outlets across the United States, uh, if it's ESPN or The Athletic, when I've been interviewed by various different people, to give an inside view of Danny Avdia, to say, you cannot look at the statistics. They don't tell the whole story. This is a guy that in the EuroLeague, was playing with 30, 35-year-old men, ex-NBA players, as a 18-year-old. You have to take that into account right off the bat. We saw him really grow up after the COVID break. There was a break between the season, uh, when, went on hold in March. The players came back in June to finish the Israeli season, just the Israeli season, and he was able to grow. He literally put on body mass. He became broader. He then also led Maccabi to the Israeli league title as a 19-year-old. And that says a lot. We've seen, we've seen uh, a high-profile Israelis in basketball in recent years. And was, there was uh, Nadav Hennefeld and, and Doron Sheffer, and of course, mm -hmm. uh, Omri Kaspi. What does um, Abdi's uh, high draft status mean for the future of Israeli basketball? Because people are now really, you know, they're paying attention. So, you know, I asked them that question. The morning of the draft, we were literally outside in a an outdoor auditorium area at 5 a.m. We had a press conference with him after he'd been selected ninth overall. And I asked him that question, what does that do for the youth? And 
he said, you know, I hope to be a good role model for the youth. And I can tell you, people are going to be picking up more basketballs. Soccer is king in Israel. The kids play soccer. There are plenty that play basketball. But as the years go on, and we saw that with Omri Caspi, there is going to be this continuous growth of the basketball programs in this country. There are people staying up in the middle of the night, 2, 3, 4 a.m., literally watching Denny Avdia play for the Wizards right now, just as people did back 10 years ago when Omri Caspi began his career. Uh, obviously, I think everybody feels that Denny Avdia has a higher upside. And because he was drafted higher, there are many more eyes in Israel. And then, of course, you have many Jews around the world, especially in North America and the United States, that want to see how Denny Avdia is going to do. I can. I know many families that subscribe now to the NBA TV package because they want to just watch Denny Avdia. That speaks a lot. You know, that that says a lot about uh, what his draft status is. Uh, definitely huge. Well, let's move to uh, soccer for a moment. Uh, I was just talking uh, actually to my wife uh, last night. Uh, she's an Israeli. And we're talking about Mordechai Spiegler, who was uh, really one of the early big international Israeli soccer stars many years ago, also played for the New York Cosmos yes. uh, back in the mid-1970s. Uh, played, uh, I think, for um, Maccabi Netanya. I uh, was a yes. big star for Maccabi Correct. Netanya. But today in soccer, uh, what about Manor Solomon, who's become an international star for uh, Shakhtar Donetsk and the Israeli national team? There are rumors uh, that he might make the move to Arsenal in the in the Premier League, uh, which certainly would raise his profile. Uh, tell us about Solomon and the future of Israeli soccer. Yeah, Menor Solomon's another good kid, uh, another young, mature mensch. And that's how you have to call it. Raised well, raised properly, good family, knowing where to invest their time. And I think this is the same thing with Denny. The parents didn't get totally involved in their careers. They allowed the coaches to really help them blossom as athletes. And that is the same case for Menor Solomon. They allowed him the space and the time to work at Maccabi Petah Tikva, who is now really bringing up a lot of young stars. Uh, and he was able to develop under their tutelage and literally just raise eyebrows as, you know, 16, 17-year-old gets bought by a team like Shakhtar Donetsk, which has a wonderful youth system. People know who is Shakhtar Donetsk. Well, they're a team that is constantly in European soccer. They are always in the Champions League. They have developed many young players, especially from Brazil. A lot of the Brazilian stars that we see out around the world today come from their youth program, which is crazy. If you think about it, they go from Brazil to the freezing cold of the Ukraine. But what's also very interesting, the head coach of Maccabi Tel Aviv today was one of the head youth department experts at Shaftar for a number of years, Patrick Van Leeuwen. And he's in a situation right now where they're continuing his development as a player. And yes, he is going to go to one of the top teams and he is a star. But he's, again, it's his modesty, his humbleness, his way to lead. That, that is how he is a leader. The fact that the top level Israeli players today, like Iran Zahavi, has taken him under his wing um, is huge. And Menor Solomon's going to be a star. Uh, he, he already is a star. Anybody that can score two goals in a game against Real Madrid is a star in my book. I think it's in anybody's book. So Menor is just a good kid. But I think what you're seeing is, again, it's the development and it's the families and it's allowing them to work with the right coaches and the right people. One of the biggest uh, sports stories that was overshadowed by the pandemic was the Israeli national baseball team qualifying for the um, Olympic baseball tournament in Tokyo, which would have been uh, last year. Uh, a lot of excitement uh, about that team uh, as a kind of the, the world baseball classic. Uh, I mean, all of the, the sudden excitement, uh, the merchandising, the caps, the, the jerseys. Give us your analysis. Uh, is there still uh, this kind of excitement around the team? And uh, once things get rolling, what are their chances of winning? Well, listen, the chances of winning are pretty good because there's only six teams in the Olympic baseball tournament. So 50% of those teams are going to win a medal, right? They're going to be giving out gold, silver, and bronze. So three of the six are winning a medal. So they're in great position. The fact that they qualified is really the big story. The fact that they were able to get through numerous uh, competitions in Europe with players that 
were not the same players that played in the World Baseball Classic. Some yes, some no. But in order to qualify for the Olympics, the players have to be citizens. They had to have made Aliyah. And Israel Baseball was able to get that done, make sure that they made Aliyah, bring over some of those good players. They were able to compete against teams like the Netherlands, who they had a problem with at the World Baseball Classic, but they ended up beating them to get into the tournament. Uh, Germany, Italy, they played against big-time teams here in Europe, and they were able to qualify, which is great. Has it made a big impact in Israel? The bottom line is, is that people like myself that are you know, repatriated from North America are going to love the baseball. Baseball is still a very slow sport for uh, for Israelis. They want action. Uh, even soccer, people say it's slow, but really there's a lot of on-field action and off-field action. Uh, baseball is still an acquired taste in Israel. There's no question. Inroads have been made by the Israel uh, Baseball Association, and they want to treat. They want to keep trying to push uh, to push the. The sport, and of course, making the Olympics. And I can tell you, I had a discussion with one of the heads of the Olympic Committee. They said, what a nightmare that they made the Olympics. They just added another 35 people to our our group that has to go. Because they're used to sending a group of maybe 40, 45 people. That was a big group. Now they're going to be sending 90 people. Said, we've never had to deal with this. So they had to bring in a whole bunch more logistical people into the Olympic offices here in Israel. Because they had to deal with now the Israeli baseball team. It's not like rhythmic gymnastics, which is just four or five people at the most as a team. This is now a full baseball team with a full staff that they have to deal with. So on that end, it's actually great because the fact that they're going to play in the Olympics is going to raise the profile amongst Israelis. And, and hopefully you'll see more Israeli kids picking up uh, bat and ball. And, and we are seeing that. The under, the under youth teams, uh, the under 16 and under 17 are really, really made up of Israelis that are being born in this country. It may be by people like myself, their children, uh, not in my case, but but in, of the like. I do have friends that have children are on those youth teams that are growing up as Israelis. And yes, uh, there is going to be a movement. I would say, you know, it's going to take time. It could take another 10, 20 years, but you'll see Israel as a potentially a nice baseball power. Well, we're going to be following their, their progress very closely once it gets underway. Final question, uh, Josh. Um, of course, covering is, is Israeli sports uh, clearly is a full-time job. But what about uh, Jewish athletes uh, elsewhere, particularly in the United States? What are your plans, uh, if any, to uh, expand your coverage? I mean, in baseball alone, we've got Dean Kramer in the the Baltimore Orioles sure. made his major league debut uh, in, in, in September. Alex Bregman, Max Fried, many others. How are you um, planning to cover that? You know, the general manager of the Philadelphia Phillies is a former Israel baseball player, Sam Fold now. So you have plenty. I'm, gr- I'm grateful you asked that question. We are about to launch a new area on our website because there is that need to really profile and focus Jews in sports, which it hasn't been done over the last four or five years. There had been a movement for many years. There were many different websites that did it, but it kind of fell off. But you know what? There are some amazing stories out there. And we've already started telling some of those stories uh, right now on the website. There's a few articles up there, but there are so many stories. Like Dean Kramer, for example, is is high on the list of people that uh, we're going to be having speak to us. But there's also so many people around the game. If it's a Sam Fold or if it's a Kenny Albert, for example, there are so many different people, announcers, baseball people, executives. Look at the commissioners. Don Garby of the MLS is Jewish. Gary Bettman in the NHL is Jewish. Adam Silver of the NBA is Jewish. There are so many Jewish owners. If it's Robert Kraft, who has done so much, obviously, for uh, Israeli sports and football in Israel. So we are definitely going to be dedicating a section on the website for that. There is a need. There is a desire. There is a want. One of the things that really brought my attention to it was back in December at the World Junior Hockey Championships. Team Canada had a Jewish goalie, uh, Devin Levy. And we ended up doing a story about him that made huge waves because no one did a story about this young Jewish goaltender from Montreal. And uh, that's a story. Uh, that's a story. Zach, I'm glad you, I'm, I'm glad you brought up hockey because in Toronto, I remember going to the uh, hockey hall of fame, going into the international section uh, and just not expecting to see a, a Jersey with Israel on it uh, or a sweater as you, as you say in hockey. And, um, 
I was so pleased really uh, to, to see that. And I know as a Canadian, you have a special interest in, yeah. in that. Well, Josh, we, we really wish you the best of luck as you expand your coverage of Jews in, in sports. And thank you so much for sharing your insights on the Israeli sports scene, the evolution of Israel sports leagues and, and how Israeli and Jewish athletes fit into the larger global world of sports. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me today, Dan. Well, if you're looking for more of our diverse content, visit our website, b'nebrith.org, to listen to all of our conversations, podcasts, and live interviews. Big thanks again to sports rabbi Josh Halleckman for joining me, and thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, make sure you never miss an episode by tapping the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Dan Mariashin. Talk to you again soon. Take care, everyone. Bye.